Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Becoming a Bible Nerd. Um, we are on chapter five of Esther this morning, so while people are getting on, gonna talk about this book that y'all are gonna get so sick of hearing from me. Um, this is the Foundations for Kids book. And, you know, in Deuteronomy, it talks about how as parents, we are supposed to impart our faith to our children. And then he gives an example of how we are to do that. And he says, when you lie down, when you walk the path, um, and he, he goes on to this list of different times in the day that we are supposed to be talking about these things. And if you really stop and think about it, we are so busy in our lives right now that we're not even walking a path to have conversation with our kids. We are running and constantly telling them, go, 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 get in the car. I set my microwave for times to tell my kids, go hurry up and get dressed because we're always in a hurry and they have that amount of time to get dressed and get back in the kitchen. And so how on earth can we fit in these times where we talk about our faith and we're not distracted? And it's difficult. We have to work hard at this. And I think that this book is such a powerful tool to at least get started on this because it gets your children in the Word every day. And it's not long um, and it's not tedious and the kids love it. Now, I've had a lot of people ask me questions about the age range. And the author of this book does not put an age on there. But um, I will tell you, my second grade daughter has been doing it. And she's a pretty fluent reader, so she's able to do this. But I think, and I know people who are using this up through upper middle school, and they have GT kids, and their kids are fluent readers, but they're still using the kid version. And let me tell you why. Because in our busy, busy schedule, if they move up to the teen version, their, their teens can do it, but it's two chapters a day, and it's likely that they'll do one or two pages and then they'll fizzle out. And that's not what we want. We want long-term um, Bible readers. And so what the children's um, version does is they condense this to a few verses a day and then it makes them, it explains it to them, it makes them put personal application, they have to read um, a prayer and pray that and uh, it can be done in about 15 minutes. So if your child is ready for a regular time of reading more than 15 minutes, that is great. But I'm going to tell you personally, the adults in my small group struggle with the amount of reading that is in the older version and we've had to shorten it for them. So we want longevity and it's getting your kids in the word where before maybe they weren't. It's giving them direction, it's giving them plan, and it's teaching them how to put thought behind what they're reading. So um, it is time to get started. Good morning, everybody. I love it when y'all say good morning, even if it's later in the day, just so that I know people are out there, I'm not alone. Um, so we're gonna get started on chapter five this morning. Uh, this chapter I mentioned is different. It's pretty cut and dry. There wasn't a lot of background knowledge or culture that we could talk about. In fact, my commentaries, Love you. Um, my commentaries were short, and so as I was looking at this, um, I just began asking the Lord what we were going to talk about, and I feel like there are four key topics this morning. So we're going to do things a little differently. We're going to talk about personal application when we get to certain things. So right away in chapter five, we see that it says on the third day, we're going to stop there. On the third day of what? It was on the third day of Esther's fast. We talked about fasting briefly last week, so we're gonna take some time and sit here this morning and soak this in. So fasting was, is whenever you do without food, and to a Jewish person, this was ingrained in their everyday life. In fact, they did this weekly, and in Matthew, we learned that the religious leaders would like put ash on their face and make themselves look frail and white and just kind of go through the city moaning and drawing attention to themselves because they wanted everyone to know how holy they were and they were fasting. And Jesus says, it's better to do this privately. That doesn't mean that you, if you're not eating and people keep asking you why, that you can't tell them. But he's just saying, let's do this in a way that it's just between you and I and you're not trying to gain um, attention from this. So this is part of the every, every weekly um, habits of a Jewish person. But we read in Acts that the early Christians continued this practice. 
and they usually did it in Acts when there was an important decision to be made. They did not take this lightly. They did not rely on their own knowledge and wisdom, but they always set time aside to ask God what he wanted. So the purpose in fasting is to take your eyes off of the things of this world and completely focus on God. And I got this from gotquestions.org, which is a really useful and safe um, website to use when you have any questions biblically. They have a team of scholars that do the research and they provide you the best answer that they um, can come up with from a biblical view. Um, fasting shows God and ourselves while we're doing it that we are serious about this. It makes us gain new perspective and a renewed reliance on God and it directs our attention back to God in this busy, busy world. Um, this is important to know. Fasting is not a way for us to get what we want. And we're going to talk about that in depth in a few minutes. It is not, the purpose isn't to get God to change something. The purpose is to get God or allow God to change us to be more like him. There's a book that I am interested in reading. I'm going to share it with you. So I have not read this book, but the author is John Piper and everything that he writes is so um, reputable and deep and good and it is forwarded by David Platt and Francis Chan two other mighty men of God that I trust and the name of the book is a hunger for God and the entire thing is about the practice of fasting and what it does spiritually so if you want more information um, I'm gonna read this book um, whenever I have a break from semesters I have a friend that is a fellow Bible nerd that I met with for lunch last week, and she is on fire, and she is wanting to do some, um, I'm sorry, the light is making a glare on my glasses. She is wanting her church to move forward in this discipleship process, so we were meeting because she is ready to just grab people up and do Bible studies in her home and, te and teach them about discipleship so that they can go out and disciple others, and um, she was telling me what happened the series of events that happened in her life that just kind of woke her up spiritually and she was um her dad had gotten a second diagnosis of um cancer he had fought it before and went into remission and it returned and the um, report that they got was not good it was it was a really bad report and she said that she went through a, a real depression where she didn't want to get out of bed and she was just defeated and one moment in her bed feeling depressed God spoke to her and she's not one I don't even think to throw that around lo loosely that God's just speaking to her but she heard the Lord's voice clearly say fast this is not a practice that she was used to I think she's probably familiar with the term but knew nothing about it so she went to church got some women that um, mentor her and said the Lord told me to fast how do I do that what is that and so they they kind of shared with her what that was and she began to fast and God turned the situation of her dad around and he's in remission and it's a miracle that this has happened but through this experience God woke her up spiritually and she is just on fire and all of this happened when she fasted now I said earlier that the important thing to know about fasting is it isn't to get what we want from God it's not a way for us to get our way so I wanted to share a flip an opposite story about fasting because it's important to know what to do when God doesn't do things our way. So I have a similar situation to uh, my friend, my mom, when I was 25, and uh, some of you that have gone through um, Matthew or Acts have heard this because I've shared it, but when I was 24, she got diagnosed with cancer and I'd just come home from Bible school and really and honestly, nothing bad had ever happened in my life. Nothing tragic, I'll say that. I've had bad things, but not no, nothing tragic had happened. And I um, kind of grew up in a Leave It to Beaver family and I was in a new place spiritually where God was just doing amazing things and my mom came down with cancer and I believed with everything within me that God was gonna heal her. I knew who his word says he, he is and I knew that he had the capability so he was gonna heal her and we fasted and we prayed and we did everything in our own power to lean on God and she died and that wrecked me because I knew that I served a God that had the power to heal her and he chose not to and so the night before she died I had to tell her goodbye you know we knew it was just gonna be hours left 
I went into my room because she was in our house on hospice and I I was so angry and disappointed in the Lord and I just began telling him all the things that I was going to do that was going to hurt him. I was going to start participating in sins that I never even wanted to participate in, but I knew that that would hurt him and I wanted him, and I'm just being honest and real here, I wanted him to hurt like I hurt. And, you know, I had a... I would say uh, um, a deeper relationship with the Lord than if this had happened years before because I'd been to Bible school. And so I feel like in this moment, he could be firm with me because of our relationship. And just like a stern father that meant business that needed to get your attention, I heard the words, I am sovereign. And so in that moment, I was like, okay, and I was at a crossroads and I really had to believe, I had to make a decision. I had to either believe that God was good and his decisions were right, or I had to believe that he couldn't be trusted and I had to make that decision. So just like my friend that had to figure out what fasting was, I had to figure out what the word sovereign meant. And it means that God is the ultimate source of power and all he has all authority over everything that he created. And in that moment, I decided to choose God's ways are right and they are good. And in fact, three days later, I, I stood up at my mother's funeral and I gave this talk that God is good no matter, even in our loss, because truth be told, we're created to be with him for eternity. He just took my mom home. She got to be where she was created to be. So those of us here on earth mourn and we hurt and we live in a fallen world because God, when he spoke light into the world, darkness had to come with it because there is no light without darkness. And so we live in this world where we have free will. We're not robots. And because of that, some bad things come with it because human flesh make bad decisions and there's also an evil power out there. And so we live in this fallen world. We're not intended to stay here forever. And so I decided to trust God. Romans 8, 28 says, we know that all things work together for the good of those that love God, who are called to his purpose. And so this is a scripture that I've seen play out in my life, that even when we don't get our way, God can work all things together for good, even tragedy. Um, whenever we are going through Matt, the study of Matthew in chapter 11, we see that John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, that was the forerunner of Christ, that was out in the desert, had followers of him proclaiming that there was a coming Messiah, baptizing people, and, um, and just having people realize that there's going to be a Messiah that's coming and getting their hearts ready and prepared, and they were repenting. He was doing mighty things, but in chapter 11, we find him in King Herod's prison. And he's about to be beheaded because he spoke out against Herod and what he was, um, some sin that he was involved in. And he knows, I mean, here, hello, the Messiah, Jesus, my cousin can save me. And Jesus does nothing to set John free. And John sends a message and even asks, are you who you say that you are? Now they are cousins and he knows and he believes that Jesus is the Messiah. But it's almost like he's trying to get him to step up and to get him out of prison. And so he challenges them. Hey, are you who you say you are? And Jesus never goes and gets him. And so we see that John ends up getting beheaded. And I'm sure that he fasted. I'm sure that he prayed. I'm sure that he relied on God. But he didn't get the answer that he was looking for. Again, John got to go home to where he was created to be in the first place. So the lesson is that God sees the big picture in his plan, in his design, and his purpose is that man come to know him so they can experience salvation. And sometimes our prayers aren't part, or the things that we want and desire aren't part of that. So when we fast and we pray, God gives us a plan. In fact, in Matthew, he says, when we pray, this is how we are supposed to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, that kingdom come, thy will be done. That's how we're supposed to pray. It's not always a wish list. We can give him a wish list, but he's saying ultimately our hearts need to be whatever your plan is, your kingdom come, your will be done. So I say that God gives us a plan of action when we fast. For my friend earlier, 
she got the answer to her prayer and it came with a plan for her to run fervently for discipleship. For me, I didn't get what I asked for, but after my mom died, I got a plan um, what path that I was supposed to take. And I know that that path got me here today. Um, a, f a friend of mine, Tara Mendoza, who's a Bible nerd, posted this probably two years ago during a study of Matthew. The quote was, pain helps us get back on the path of righteousness. We have to go through pain sometimes to get on that path of righteousness. I posted a picture this week and it was a picture of a desert mountain and you could see lines going through it. Those are called paths of righteousness. So when the Psalmist David talks about paths of righteousness, he is literally talking about these lines through the mountain. See, shepherds are constantly moving their sheep from one place to another and sheep are dumb and they're blind and they're just kind of going every direction, but they have learned one thing, to hear and follow their master's voice. And the master sets this path of righteousness. So these paths are shepherd's paths through to safety through the mountain. And as they speak, the sheep follow them. It's the right path. So in our lives, we can be following God. We can be doing good things for him, but it wasn't his will. He has a certain plan for his kingdom to come. And sometimes like sheep, we're just going off blindly, doing our own thing, thinking it's good. But if we hear the master's voice, we get back on that path of righteousness. And unfortunately, a lot of times it takes pain to get us to stop and to listen for that voice. And so all that to say is when we fast, it's, we don't always get what we want, but God leads us back to paths of righteousness to get on his plan and his path for our life. So that's verse one, but we're going to stick here for a minute more. The second part of verse one says that she dressed up in her royal clothing and stood in the inner courtyard of the palace facing it. She is about to approach the king. And one thing that I, um, when I was studying, that I realized is that she approached, her approach to the king, though dangerous because she could get the death penalty, you weren't supposed to approach the king without him summoning you, but she did it in a very respectful yet bold way. She dressed up in her um, queen attire and she didn't just barge in, but she goes where he can see her. And everything about her plan that God gave her through fasting was respectful yet bold. And when we live in a culture that is completely um, opposite of God's way. And so we are going to be constantly challenged, especially by unbelievers who do not believe the same way we do. And they're going to be mean and they are going to bully and they are going to make us look like the ones that are evil and I believe that this lesson was to teach us that we when we encounter these moments we need to be respectful to them because we're never gonna reach them if we do the same thing that they do belittle and, and and bully and be mean we need to be respectful but at the same time we need to be bold and we need to stand firm on our beliefs I like to picture Joy Bayer whenever I'm thinking about this because I do believe that she is um, blinded in her sin in fact we have these prayer cards that we use at our church where we pray for the lost and it gives scriptures for us to pray over them. And I was thinking about her. Um, in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. They are blinded. I believe that she is blinded. And in her blindness, she is mean and she's a bully and she is coming to try to destroy anything that stands for Christianity. But in this moment... Um, how can we, like, I had to ask myself, how can we reach people like this? Well, I just kind of picture her as this child that is blindfolded going through an obstacle course. And she's so mad at the obstacles, which would be Christianity, that she, she comes across because she doesn't know that it's really the blindfold that is preventing her from getting across. And so she doesn't know. She's just doing what she knows. And, and that allows me to have empathy for people like this. And so um, we can begin praying that these blinders get removed. And we know that God can do it because we see it in Acts with Saul. He literally had scales fall off of his eye, eyes and then he could see that Jesus was the Messiah. So 
we need to pray that these skills are removed and we also need to love them like our neighbor. Jesus says, love your neighbors yourself. And I don't know about you, but I put a lot of time and energy into myself. We do things that we don't even realize because it's just so part of our culture that is completely for ourselves. And so if we begin to love others as much as we love ourselves, that's a lot of loving going on. And so we need to reach these people with love, but at the same time, we need to be firm and bold. So moving on, and this is gonna go a little bit over today, but the king ends up extending his, his scepter and um, showing that God is behind the scenes and he says, what do you want, Esther? I'll give you up to half of the kingdom, which is an exaggeration, but it's there to show him, to show Esther, hey, I will give you anything you ask for. So she says, come to a banquet and invite Haman. And they hurried there. And at the banquet, he says, again, what is it that you want? I'll give you up to half the kingdom. And she says, I want you to come to another banquet tomorrow. She is taking God's plan and she's being patient as she does this. So in verse 9, we see that Haman leaves feeling pretty good. He is the king's right-hand man, and now Queen Esther has invited only her husband and him to this special banquet, and they get to go to one again tomorrow. So as he goes out, he passes Morty, and Morty does not bow to him, and this just enrages him. So even though he's on top of the world and he has found success and he has found favor and all these things are going into his way, he goes home and he tells his wife and friends that even though he's found success, none of this makes him satisfied. What a lesson for us to learn today. We could have everything this world has to offer. We can have riches and we can have toys and we can have beauty and we can have friends and we can go on vacation and the list can go on and on and on, but that will never satisfy. We will always stay hungry for more, but satisfaction comes from a relationship with God and a grateful heart. I know that in times of my life that I'm feeling down and I'm wanting more and I get self-consumed, I always go back to one habit that has always helped me get out of this and it's to journal thankfulness every day I will get up and this is something I should do every day but you know in good times you just start being lax in your practices um, but every day I try to write in a journal one thing that I'm thankful about because there's a million things that we could be thankful about and we focus on those things we find satisfaction in the Lord. And so that is one way to battle, is being grateful and writing down what you're grateful for and telling the Lord. But we are in this constant pursuit of pleasure because we believe that pleasure is gonna lead to satisfaction of life. I was reading during researching this that actually dissatisfaction is the root of most sin. And I was thinking about that. We have this never ending thirst and we'll go to great lengths for this thirst to be quenched, this thirst of satisfaction. And that leads to sexual sin. That's why people are cheating on their spouses. It's because they're not satisfied with something in their inner core and they think it's their spouse that has the responsibility to satisfy them when it's God. And so they go out looking for other people. That's why people spend money out of control. They just think, and this is, hey, this is my weakness. They think, oh, if I just have this, it will bring me joy. And it does bring you joy for about five minutes. And then when it's over, you just have to look for the next thing. Um, altering self-image. This is huge. And the Lord has just really been speaking to me about this because it's something I battle with because you look and you see all these gorgeous people and just think of all the things that we as women are tempted to do to our face. Right now, it is so common for us to change our eyebrows and to add lashes and to get Botox and to make our lips bigger. And the list goes on and on and on. And if you step back and think about it, we are made in the image of God and he is our creator and he made us perfect. I mean, he spent time and energy to think about it, but it's like there's this little voice in the back of our mind that is saying it is not enough. I have to look like more. And believe me, like I say, when, when I, I speak of this, this is something that's on my mind about myself. And I, and I have to fight this battle. And, um, you know, especially now I'm on camera and I don't look like the world that has this radiant beauty and everything about him is perfect and then you know you look at yourself and you're like oh just blah um and it's so tempting to 
to spend so much time and energy focused on these things. And it is really um, going back to being satisfied. It's a lack of satisfaction in ourselves and we think that we will achieve this satisfaction if we look perfect. This is personal for me. I'm, I'm really not trying to step on anyone's toes and if you had things done, I, look, this hair, this isn't real. I'm part of it, you know, like these are extensions that we, we have this desire that if we just have look perfect, then we will be satisfied. Um, I, I would think that probably the most beautiful women in the world naturally are not satisfied if they don't have a relationship with God, so that's not the answer. Um, all of these things are forms of idol worship. We have set ourselves up as an idol. Um, John Piper has this quote, and love it, and he's very famous for it. He says this all the time. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. We're going to stop and think. God is most glorified in us. Isn't that our job as Christians to be a light? That when people see us, they see God. That's how God is glorified. When people look at us, they don't see us. They see God's glory. And how is he most glorified? When we are completely satisfied in him and him alone. Jesus says in Matthew, I'm the bread of life. And he also says, out of our hearts will flow rivers of living water. To us, this is hard to understand as Westerners, but to Easterners, they get this. That means that they're completely satisfied, that their, their stomachs don't hunger for food and their souls aren't thirsty for more, that he completely satisfies those. And we'll talk about more of that next semester. We'll, we'll study this in depth when we go through John next semester. So um, Haman's friends say, We've got a plan to get you satisfied. And immediately they tell him, you need to build a gallow, which basically these gallows, when we read this, I'm sure that we all picture um, something where people are being hung. That is not the case in the Persian Empire. Execution on a cross was what was starting to form. Romans perfected it. But we're talking about execution here. We're talking about um probably whatever would be before the cross came. But people are gonna be impaled on this. And they say, build a gallow 75 feet high and ask the king to hang Mordecai on it in the morning. That's how you're gonna be satisfied. And so our last lesson of the day is to be careful about taking ungodly advice because it will kill you spiritually. If you have read ahead, you are gonna know that this very thing, and I'm sorry, but if, spoiler alert, this very thing that Mordecai is going to have built is going to kill him. Not, I, I'm sorry, not Mordecai, not Mordecai. The very thing that Haman is going to build is for Mordecai is going to kill him instead. And so when we take godly advice, it can kill us spiritually. We have to take godly advice. We must seek godly counsel. In fact, Proverbs 19.20 says, Hear counsel, receive instruction, accept correction this is so hard for us but we have to humble ourselves where we accept correction and um it says that you may be wise in time to come we have, need to find people in our lives that read god's word that study god's word and will give us advice based on what god's word says not how they feel um so when we do this i'm running out of time and i had things to say but we have to find this and sometimes it might hurt sometimes it might step on our toes and we need to be open to this because growth will happen and we will grow to be wise on the flip side of that we must give godly counsel we live in this world that we are inundated with social media and tv and billboards and um, just subliminal messages that are telling us how we need to believe um, an example will be that it is okay to, to live together outside of marriage, that sex out of marriage is no big deal when the Bible speaks multiple times that this is contrary. But I run into people all the time that don't know this to be true because guess what? Every second of every day we are inundated with songs and TV and literature and everything that it's just common that people do this. It's okay to have sex out of marriage. And so... The world begins to shape our belief system and we don't even realize it. So we have to have a biblical worldview. That means every decision um, or advice that we give, we need to have to go look and see if this is really in the wor word or is this just how I feel because the world I live in. And I have to check myself all the time because a lot of times I feel one way, but the word of God, whenever I look in, in, in research, 
God has a very different view of this. So we have to give advice based on a biblical worldview. And this can be hard. I know my personality is a people pleaser, so I just want my friends to feel good whenever um, <coughs> they're going through something. And so I'll just share a quick story and we'll close up. But um, several years ago, I found myself um, at a function for little kids and it was um, just not a good place to, to, to give some hard advice. But I had a friend that I was sitting with and um, she had let me know that her and her husband was separated and she was seeking a divorce. And it was her marriage, I mean, marriages are tough. Yes, we, we all um, go through these seasons where it's really tough and um, you know different scenarios can take place. But there was no biblical reason for her to leave. And she looked at me and she was like, I'm just miserable and don't I deserve to be happy? And in that moment, in the chaos of the function and people sitting near, I knew I had to speak truth to her. Everything within me wanted to just grab her and say, yes, you deserve to be happy. I want you to be happy. We want our friends to be happy, not miserable. But I knew that there was no biblical reason for her to leave. And um, so as crazy as the atmosphere was, I had to speak truth to her. And they are married to this day. And it's just things that we have to work through. I remember Gary Thomas in his book, Sacred Marriage, he says, what if God, God designed marriage to make us holy rather than make us happy? So marriage is there to teach us how to be selfless and how to love unconditionally. And there's a lot of things in life that it's not really for our happiness um, that God designed it, but it is to make us holy and it's to put us on those paths of righteousness. So, lessons from Esther chapter 5. I ended up falling in love with this chapter. There was so much to learn. We are going to close up for today. We are not going to meet next week. We're going to take the week off for spring break. Have fun with your families. But we will... Come on in here, baby. I got a little baby Bible nerd that's dying to say hi. hi. We will get caught up with y'all week after next and we are going to do chapter six and seven together so you have two weeks you can do six and seven they're easy reads but when we discuss this we'll talk about both of those together we hope you have a great week you want to tell them um, happy, reading. happy reading happy reading